Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got a wonderful guest on today who's a wonderful advocate and has been through so much loss. And I know that our audience is going to get a lot of information and a lot of ideas on how we're all going to get through. So Heidi, you want to introduce him? Sure, Mom. And like you said, today we are going to be talking about grief support. And our guest is going to be Fred Guttenberg. And Fred is no stranger to loss. His 14-year-old daughter, Jamie, was murdered in the Parkland school shootings. And just four months before Jamie was killed, his brother, Michael, died from a cancer-related death after his service in 9-11. So we'll be talking to him about how he has survived and how he has gone on to find hope again after the death of his daughter and his brother. And he is the author of a phenomenal book called Find the Helpers. And as a Mr. Rogers fan knows, that's what he always said, find the helpers. If we do not look for the helpers, we will feel like there's no hope in life, like there's no reason to go on. We need to find the helpers when there's been major tragedy. And that is definitely what Fred has done. And this book has won a Nautilus Book Award. So welcome to our show, Fred. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you on the show. It's been five years since you lost your brother and daughter, right? So a little less, <clears throat> um, in October, it'll be five years with, for my brother. And then in February, five years with Jamie, mm -hmm. um, they were four months apart. Michael, uh, died in October of 2017 and Jamie was killed in February of 2018. Mm -hmm. Wow. What's changed for you over the last five years? <sighs> Everything. Um, you know, I, I often joke that before February 14th, 2018, I was still just this goofy dad of two uh, living the all American family experience. You know, my wife and I, our two kids, our two dogs, you know, dividing and conquering, getting my son to hockey, my daughter to dance. You know, it was very normal and typical. And, um, I had uh, sold my business about uh, almost a year before mm -hmm. my daughter was killed. Um, and that, that most of that year was actually spent going back and forth to take care of my brother. Uh, and I was looking forward after he passed to getting back to some degree of normal, uh, not going back and forth to take care of him, but actually going forward, finding some new professional role for me in my life, getting back to just um, being this family of four. And um, what I wasn't planning for after my brother died, only four months after, was my daughter getting killed and it changed everything. You know, I was wondering with these high profile losses, you know, over the past five years, have you seen that it's different for you as compared with the other brief people that you've connected with? Yeah, it is a great question. And I'll answer it this way. It's different for everybody. I, I, I think the greatest single piece of advice that I received going through grief actually came from our now president, Joe Biden. Um, I had the chance three, almost four weeks after Jamie was killed to spend time alone with him. And he came prepared to talk to me about going forward from grief. He is a man who understands loss deeply. Um, as a young dad, his wife and children were killed in a car accident. And then um, only a couple of years before he became president, his son, Bo, died of cancer. Uh, so he understands grief deeply. And he said a few things to me that just to this day really formed the foundation of how I went forward. And one was, he asked me what my plan was. 
And I didn't really have a plan. He, he, you know, he wanted to know all about my family, but I didn't really have a plan. I gave him a few specific things and he started talking to me about mission and purpose. And that has become like my defining words for how I describe my life since. But he then went on to give me this couple of pieces of advice that have really worked out true. He said, everything that comes to you now as a memory that brings a tear, the day is going to come where that same memory will bring you a smile, mm -hmm. where you'll look back and instead of crying, you'll remember that joyful moment. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that's a different timing for everybody. But he goes, trust me, that day is going to come. And he specifically described for me the day for him when he realized that. And he said, what you need to understand right now is we all grieve differently. No two people grieve the same way. And so in your own home, if you guys can come up with a plan that gives each other the space to grieve in your own unique way, but to also comfort and support one another as you go through those different ways of grieving, you'll be okay. And he was right. I will tell you, I have lived a very um, public life since my daughter's murder. My wife and son have needed intense privacy. We've gone through this very differently. If not for, for Joe Biden saying that to me, I might have thought, what's wrong with us? Mm -hmm. But I never did. I'm guessing, Fred, so you've honored the way that your wife and son have grieved and recognize that it's different than your way and that's that's okay. It, it, it is okay. Um, it has to be okay because I can't let what happened to my family destroy what's left of my family. And, mm -hmm. and, and so we, we made a determination um, and it hasn't always, listen, it hasn't always been easy. Um, mm -hmm. But we really go out of our way to find our moments to be together, to support one another, um, and 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 to make sure that we are always there for one another. I, I think, just speaking for me, from the from the very earliest days after my daughter was killed, I remember more directly saying to my son, but I've said it to my wife as well. I am okay and I'm going to be okay because I intend to be around for a lot of years watching what is still meant for us in the rest of our life. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a message I constantly try to tell my son who's only 21 mm -hmm. because I want to grow old watching him grow old in spite of our loss. Well, Fred, can I tell you as a brief sibling, that is the biggest gift you can give a surviving child. Because when I, when my brother and cousin died together at 17 in a car accident, I was terrified I was gonna lose a parent because my parents were so distraught and so, as you know, just devastated. And I thought, I don't know what I'm gonna do if I lose a parent. So I think out there for all the parents out there, what Fred just said is so key. We need to know that you're going to be okay and that you're going to be around for a long time. So thank you for giving that gift to your son. I assume you must take care of yourself. Taking care of yourself isn't just a physical thing. It's a mental thing. And, and I do. I try to find ways to uh, do things that I know I enjoy. I'm a car nut. I love mm -hmm. the mountains. I love being outdoors. And so, and my wife and son are the same way. So we do try to take as much advantage of getting into those environments that we love. I say I live in Florida, but I go to the mountains for peace. Um, and we go there as often as we can up to North Carolina. We just love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's so important to take care of yourself. And, and it's hard at first. I mean, right after these kinds of losses, I remember when Scott died, you know, you feel like you shouldn't be taking care of yourself. You should be taking care of the world. And uh, that can be problematic for your health. And we know there are people who die of broken hearts 
really literally, there's something called the broken heart syndrome. Well, I, I have a wife who uh, fortunately keeps me grounded when I get so occupied with all this public stuff I do and I'm running around who uh, is always there to make sure that I, I, I remember me once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, well, and and so I'm, I'm very lucky about that. Good well, Fred, you said, you said something earlier about how if you, you were given advice with, with, by Joe Biden, where he said, someday you'll look back and the memories will bring you joy. Are you at that place yet? It's a great question. Um, and this, this, the answer to this actually kind of ties into the other thing I said, which is we all grieve differently. So what's so strange for, for my wife and I, from day one, I was kind of able to look at pictures. And some of them made me cry, but some of them even from the early days made me smile. I was able to do it. My wife struggled with the photos, but she couldn't put down the videos. Like she would sit there and look at Jamie's phone every day and pull up all the videos that Jamie did just because she had to see it. And and in the in the early days, she it didn't make her happy to see it, but she just had to. Mm -hmm. We're at that point now where those saying I couldn't look at the videos for two years. I just I couldn't. But I can now. Like she'll show me these videos and we watch them and we laugh together because that's our kid. And, 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 and we laugh because we remember the memory. Um, so we are there. There are certain things that um, I remember we videoed or took a photo of that have such, such a deep uh, commitment uh, in terms of, or meaning in terms of when we did it, that I still have not gone to rewatch them. I will, I know I will, because um, I'm getting a lot better about it. In fact, last year, uh, July for Jamie's birthday, for the first time since she was killed, I went back and watched the uh, bat mitzvah montage that we had done of her, which really just showed her life from birth all the way through the age of 13. It was the first time that I had done it. And, um, I kind of, it was a combination of laughing, smiling, and crying all at once. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. But I watched it, and, I, and I've watched it since, and, and, I, and, and, and I'm glad I have. You know, I, I, I don't ever want to put those things away and never see them again. Well, it, it's kind of like when somebody said, you know, how gratitude, and at first it was it was hard, but now... I realized that I'm grateful that I have my brother in my life for 17 and a half years. Like we are so lucky that we had Jamie, Michael and Scott in our lives. You still do. Well, that's you know? true. I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit again about high profile loss because we have had uh, Candace Leitner on uh, a few times and we know Candace and she started Mothers Against Drunk Driving basically right after her daughter died. And she did make one comment to us. She said that she was so busy with legislation for about three years that it was a little difficult when she slowed down and she felt like she delayed the grieving process for herself. Have you noticed anything like that? It's a great question. Um, I feel like I make time for myself to grieve. But I also know that I have put this effort on a pedestal front and center above everything else. And it's, it's the worry my wife has for me when I finally am done with it all, how I'm going to be. Um, I, I believe I will be fine. I believe I will find other ways to occupy my time. Maybe, you know, uh, things completely removed from this, new hobbies, whatever. Um, I'm already thinking about what they could be. Uh, but I, I, it's, it's strange because I have. I've gone 24-7 mm -hmm. in this effort to do something about gun violence. But I've been able to still focus on what my loss is. I still go and spend time with my daughter at the cemetery. I write a lot and I 
feel as if writing keeps me connected to Jamie and my grief and my loss. It's how I keep myself in a place where all the different emotions get to be um, processed and I get to do something with them. Talk to us about um, your writing. How did you decide to write? You'd never written before. And I know our audience is going to be interested in this because it sounds like it's something that could help them also. And, and I encourage people to write as often as I can now. Um, an amazing funeral director um, is the answer. When I was planning Jamie's funeral, he handed me a journal. And he said, have you ever written before? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, not, you know, stuff just, you know, what, not since school or my business when I was writing emails and Facebook. And he's like, no, I mean, like, have you ever really written? You know, I said, no, I guess not. He goes, I want you to take this journal. And when you're ready, I want you to use it. And I did. And very shortly after we buried Jamie, I started writing in it about my day, about my feelings, about how hard it was to get through this day, or about maybe how I got through this day in an unexpectedly better way because of this experience. But every day I wrote. And in April of 2018, I went to my wife and I said, I want to write a book. I want to write about our story of what happened in these two American tragedies and how the country responded differently. And so I started working on that and worked on that for a really long time, but it was therapeutic for me. I wanted to see if you had a piece of advice or if you had one piece of advice for those who are newly bereaved, what would it be? And also I want to give, uh, want you to tell us where to get your book and all your website and it any information you want us to know about you? My advice to people going through grief, it's going to be twofold. A, don't let anyone else dictate your pace. Uh, you have to do what you do when you're ready and when it feels okay. A lot of other people are going to try and encourage you and counsel you and don't let anyone else dictate your pace. You'll get there. And if you need someone's help, you be the one to it'd be okay asking for it. And, and that's one of the key things about my book is you know who your helpers are and be okay receiving their help. But the other piece of advice, and, and I will tell you what I think maybe was the most important thing for me, is what I call permission to be honest. When I learned how to tell people I'm not okay talking about this today. Or when I learn how to tell people, I know your questions are well-intentioned when you are asking me about how I'm doing or this one is doing or what happened here or, or you, but they're not helping me. And so I'm not okay responding today. Um, you know, people who go through grief, often we become the counselors to others because they want, it's like, we have to make them feel better <laughs> by telling them we're doing okay. Well, we don't feel like telling them we're doing okay. You, because of your unique experience, you have permission to be honest. You don't have to, you know, tell people how you're feeling. And if you don't want to discuss something, it's okay to tell them that. Understanding we all grieve differently. We all get through this. We all get to go forward. We all get to live lives with those that are still around us and who we love deeply and who love us. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful piece mm -hmm. of advice. Now, where can people get, find the helpers? What 9-11 in Parkland taught me about recovery, purpose, and hope? Well, it's available um, on Amazon. Um, there is uh, also available through all the independent bookstores. Um, there is uh, b and Books in Miami. They actually have signed copies of the book that they sell. Uh, and you can just go on their website to order it. Every book that they have in their inventory, like I said, has been signed by me. FredGuttenberg.com. Um, and I put my speeches on there. Um, there's a way to contact me on there. You can order books through my website as well. Um, 
And um, yeah, I love hearing from people. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Fred, and for all the good you're doing in the world. And I know this show's going to help a lot of people. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you for being such an exemplifier of hope. And I love Jamie's quote behind you. Dreams and dedication are a powerful combination. She sounds like a phenomenal child and your brother sounds amazing as well. Thanks everybody for tuning into the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.